Hey there, Extra Historians. Welcome to Lies, the part of the show where we tell you what we got wrong, what we left out, and talk a little bit about what's coming up on Extra History. So, we have a little bit of a different Lies this time because we had two short series. Uh, we had The Siege of Vienna and Queen and Zynga. I'm not going to talk too much about Queen and Zynga because I didn't write it. We got an excellent guest writer named Cassandra Kaw. She's written a lot of really cool horror novellas from Rupert Wong Cannibal Chef, which is very, very neat. Uh, if you can imagine a guy cooking for the ghouls of Kuala Lumpur, that's basically what you got. Uh, and she also did A Song for Quiet, which is a Lovecraftian detective horror. Uh, she also wrote the lead story in Warhammer Horror's new Maledictions anthology, so you can check that out. It's very neat. So, let's start out with our recommended reading, which is Enemy at the Gate, Habsburgs, Ottomans, and the Battle for Europe by Andrew Wheatcroft. It's a modern and very readable treatment of this battle. I highly recommend it. If you want to get a little bit deeper into the weeds, I would suggest The Siege of Vienna, The Last Great Trial Between Cross and Crescent by John Stoy. It's very slow to get going. It's quite exciting toward the end. Uh, there's a lot of name dropping, and it's a little harder to get into, so it's not a pleasure read, but it has a lot of really good information in it. I recommend that one too. Uh, and I'm just going to bump this one in. Uh, if you liked our one-off, you can pick this up from the National Park Service. Hispanics in the Civil War, From Battlefield to Homefront. Really great little short book. Uh, I hope you liked that one-off. Something I've been wanting to talk about for a long time. We have a couple of upfront issues that we need to talk about. One of them is that our first Siege of Vienna episode got demonetized by YouTube. We're not really sure how this or why this happened. Uh, it's been said that you're not supposed to blink out to a charity, uh, but we've done that before and not been demonetized, so we're not really sure if that's the reason. A lot of people who talked about Christ, the Christchurch shooting got demonetized kind of in a blanket demonetization, it looks like. It might have just been that, but either way, the point is uh, we are very, very grateful to our patrons uh, to, for, for funding our series in a way that if something like this happens unexpectedly, then we're not uh, taking a huge hit financially because we are not ad revenue dependent. We're, uh, we are dependent on you, the patrons. So thank you very much uh, for letting us talk about issues that may be a little bit tougher uh, or may in surprisingly intersect with a news event. Uh, when we had not realized that that was going to be the case. Uh, I also want to point out, in addition to our recommended reads, Vienna and Istanbul are two of my fa two favorite cities. I have some stuff that I got there. I went at Christmas. That's why there's a Christmas market mug here. Uh, but if you go to Vienna, you can go to the uh, Museum of Military History, the HGM. You can see a bunch of artifacts from the Siege of Vienna, including a Turkish guide on, uh, a reflex bow used by an Ottoman cal uh, cavalryman. And uh, if you are a fan of our World War I series, uh, The Seminole Tragedy, they also have basically everything you could imagine from the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand. Very somber, very spooky. They have the limo, the uniform he was wearing at the time, the pistol that killed him. Uh, very rarely can you stand that close to something that just completely changed world history. Also, about Vienna, if you go to Vienna, the old city wall is completely destroyed at this point, but uh, the Ringstrasse is basically where it was. I also wanted to mention thank you for Ali for doing an excellent job on the artwork, skipping between Vienna and Istanbul and Angola and Hawaii and this... American Southwest in this series of episodes. Very difficult technically to do. She did a spectacular job. So, some issues from episode one. A lot of people mentioned that uh, we should have gone into the fact that the Janissaries were recruited by being tithed away from families in Eastern Europe, that they were essentially kidnapped, that sometimes families in Eastern Europe would cut off their children's fingers to prevent them from being taken. This is true, but the Janissaries as an organization existed for centuries, and they changed significantly over, the, over that period. 
we're dealing with the Janissaries at a later time where they were mostly recruited from Janissary families. What happened is that the Janissaries were created to create a unit that did not have family ties with other families that could be personally loyal to the Sultan, right? It's the idea of, okay, well, Ottoman court politics are extremely dangerous and we don't want uh, a military unit that is loyal to someone else. We want it only loyal to the Sultan. And the idea was, well, you take these kids from the provinces and you make them loyal to the Sultan by giving them a lot of rights, a lot of money, but you put certain restrictions on them about not starting families or owning businesses. But all those restrictions gradually got repealed. So you got to the point where there were Janissary families, where you wanted your kid to be in the Janissaries because you had been in the Janissaries and you'd gotten a lot of economic political power. A lot of the businesses at the time that were the most successful in the Ottoman Empire were Janissary owned. So at this point, it's not so much a, a unit of like kids that have been ripped away from their families in the provinces. It's more people who wanted to be there. We also need to talk about the motives. How do we know the motives of Kara Mustafa and Mehmed? We don't really. A lot of this is surmised by histori historians. A lot of the early uh, European accounts of this battle is that Kara Mustafa was doing it by, basically by himself. This was his pet project because he was so greedy and wanted all the riches of Vienna. Not very likely. Uh, it's also unlikely he would have been able to do something this big without the Sultan's support. In the Ottoman Empire, it was often sort of a thing where uh, the Sultan would want something done or would have an idea or champion a project, but he would do it in private. And in public, it would be all his vizier. So if it turned out to be a disaster, then the vizier could get blamed rather than the Sultan. And again, that's why the Sultan marches the army to Belgrade, and then he goes back and Kora Mustafa uh, continues and if you're successful, great, the Sultan had a great plan. And if you're not successful, well, then that's on you. Uh, our biggest, probably the biggest thing we got wrong is that we called what was then still called Constantinople, Istanbul. It was actually called Istanbul then, but it was not officially called Istanbul. But it was, there was a lot of mix. There were people's titles in the government that uh, used the word Istanbul in them. It's taken from the Greek. Uh, it means to the city or going to the city. Uh, so this is a little bit squishier, but uh, yes, it should be Constantinople. I just want to make clear the Ottomans were not trying to conquer Europe. You hear a lot uh, of this myth that started at that time that the Ottomans had this idea that they were going to bring all of Europe under the Ottoman banner. Very unlikely, very unrealistic. Uh, it's unclear whether they even would have been able to hold Vienna if they had taken it. This was really at the furthest extent of Ottoman power at that time. Yeah, the idea that the Ottomans were just going to like march all the way to the English Channel, no, not really. Occasionally Ottoman ships would show up in the English Channel and there'd be a big panic in England, like, oh, the Ottomans are gonna invade us. But this was really something that had more to do with the mind of uh, Europeans at that time than the actual capabilities of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, we said that Charles II, the King of Spain, was on his deathbed, and people pointed out, yeah, but he lived like 17 more years till 1700. He was very sick at the time, but he got better. At that time, they thought that he was going to die. Charles of Lorraine took a dive off a bridge and survived. Everyone wanted to know about that. Believe me, I would have told you if I could find more details than that. Uh, maybe it's in a, a source that's in German, uh, but I couldn't find it. I want to know that story too. Vienna was very vertical. It was a, a city that built up inside its walls rather than out. There were districts outside the city, but a lot of people just built the buildings up taller. And that's why at the beginning of the siege, when the, the Ottomans are kind of like plinking the tops of church spires and things like that, those made very good gunnery targets because these tall buildings were above the city wall. But here's an interesting thing. There were parts of the city that were so built up that the streets only got sunlight for one hour a day because of the positioning of the sun. Like it was noon until you could get direct sunlight. Episode two, the Ottomans dug using this really interesting uh, sitting down position cross-legged with these short handled pickaxes. And that's one of the reasons they could dig so quickly. Uh, I didn't put that in the art because I thought it would be a little bit confusing without being explained. Uh, that time when the Ottomans sprung a mine during a shift change and they thought that they were going to kill twice as many defenders Actually, they ended up killing almost no one at all because everyone was off the wall for the shift change. Uh, 
very badly timed, and as a result, they had a double guard duty that could rush into the gap and help hold it, and that's one of the reasons it didn't fall. At that point, also in that attack, we used some Polish banners rather than Ottoman. Sorry about that. We'll talk a little bit about why some of those mistakes slipped through later. I wanted to point out when we showed Rimpler's death, we know that he was mortally wounded in that attack and later died a few days later. We don't know the circumstances of that wound, except that he got wounded in the arm or shoulder. All of the stuff about him being there and the mind spring and him getting covered with splinters, I put that in so that we could explain a little better in a way that had some uh, interesting action, how those defenses would work when the, uh, a mine went off and they suddenly became like a debris field. Uh, and also we just had to get some idea of the, the, the difficulty of this battle and how nasty it was when a mine went off below you and suddenly the air is full of wooden splinters. The term roof rabbit for a cat that you eat could be of later German origin rather than uh, during the siege. Maybe. We're not sure. Episode 3, let's talk about Winged Hussars. So the the popular conception of this battle is kind of like Minas Tirith from Lord of the Rings, right? Uh, uh, in that, like, there's these this big cavalry charge from, like, down the hills. Didn't happen that way. Uh, in fact, the battle was mostly won at that time. The infantry really won the Battle of Vienna. Uh, however, it was Polish infantry that really, like, came in a little bit late, but were the decisive factor, uh, it's been argued. So... Possibly it's the Polish infantry rather than the Polish cavalry. We should be, uh, we should be celebrating Sabaton. I, I think you should do a song about the Polish infantry just kind of like trudging along and doing dirty work. And then the winged hussars come and take all the glory. However, they are the ones that broke the Ottoman army, the, the winged hussars. But it was more a thing of, okay, do we finish them off today, tomorrow? John Sobieski wanted a big dramatic conclusion to the battle great sort of propaganda coup uh but yeah it was it was incredible to watch and they did break the last of the turkish army but they were probably broken at that time anyway literally when they were making the decision it was kind of like john sobieski like i want to use my cool winged cavalry and another general literally said i'm old and i want to sleep in a bed tonight let's finish this now um so it doesn't take away from the coolness of this event, but on the other hand, it's like, it's interesting to understand that, like, they were not the decisive factor in winning this battle, right? There were also Muslim Tartars fighting in the Polish army, just like there were Christians fighting in the Ottoman army. Again, it complicates this narrative that has been hanging around since the event, that this was a giant knockdown, dragout fight between Christianity and Islam. No, no, much more complicated than that. Uh, there were Protestants on the Ottoman side. There were Tartars on the Christian side. Uh, the, uh, the Protestant Saxons ended up leaving the Holy League after the Battle of Vienna because they were so badly treated by their Catholic comrades and realized that they were not really full partners in this. And of course, the French had better relations with the Ottomans than they did with the Habsburgs. And that's one reason that they were just like, yeah, no, you can, whatever. We have a good trade agreement with the Ottomans. So again, this idea of Christianity versus Islam, it really falls apart when you kind of interrogate this battle in any way whatsoever. Kar Mustafa's execution, less about losing at Vienna and more about the counterattack by the Holy League that took a bunch of Ottoman territory. It was understood that this was a big ask, right? That taking Vienna was something that was at the edge of uh, the empire's abilities. But then losing some of the empire, that's the thing that really got him in trouble. And uh, I read one account that basically uh, the executioner showed up and was like, you know what I'm here to do? I'm here to do the thing. And Karl Mustafa was like, okay, do the thing. And then he got strangled to death with a silk cord. Not a great end for Karl Mustafa. And of course, 100 years later, this expansion of... Uh, the Habsburgs into Eastern Europe would end quite badly for Poland when they participated in the partition of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth between uh, Austria, Prussia, and Russia. So again, like this stuff about like Christianity versus Islam, when you, again, when you like get in there, yeah, not exactly. I did want to point out, uh, supposedly, supposedly, a precursor to the croissant was invented in uh, Vienna. 
aping the uh, crescents on the Turkish flags as a celebration of victory. Probably legend, not fact. And supposedly one of the things that was looted from the Turkish baggage train was the first coffee to come to Vienna, and that started the cafe industry in Vienna. Also probably not true. Uh, we know the first cafe that started in Vienna was by an Armenian man. It was two years after the siege. Coffee probably would have gotten pretty old and soggy by then. It's a very interesting piece of food history that uh, is connected to this. All right, let's talk about Queen Nzinga. And I just want to start off by saying there were a few mistakes that I caused during editing. I edited these right after my daughter was born, and I was literally, like, sitting in a hospital hallway while she was in neonatal ICU. She's fine. She just had a, a little bit of a rough start. Uh, so I made some mistakes, uh, and they're on me, not Cass. Uh, but we said the uh, 1626 was in the 16th century. It's in the 17th century. Interestingly, in the comments, I found out that not all uh, not all nations do it that way. There are places where 1626 is the 16th century. So that could have been a, a little bit of thing between uh, Cassandra and I. She's Malaysian. So they might do it differently. Uh, how did they sterilize Nzinga? Apparently it involved boiling water. Yeah. A lot of you wanted us to expand a little bit about Nzinga's role in slavery. It's controversial, to put it mildly. Uh, there are people that say Nzinga was a happy participant in uh, selling slaves to uh, European powers. There are people who say that she was absolutely against slavery uh, or only participated in uh, the indigenous styles of slavery. And there are people that say, well, she participated but it was a calculus saying that, okay, well, if I'm in charge of this, then I can give over fewer people than would be taken in raids. I don't know. It's hard to know exactly what she thought. Uh, and again, there are lots of different perspectives on her, even at her time. And we have letters directly from her. They don't necessarily address this issue in particular. In the similar vein, uh, there are all these rumors and stories that she either killed the, the slave or servant, the attendant, that she uh, sat on during the meeting with the governor, or that she said to the governor, you can have this one, I don't, uh, I don't sit on uh, my attendance twice. So we've, n apparently in no source did we come across, uh, was the second story that she gave uh, the attendant to the governor. There is this story about her killing attendants, but, uh, it's one of those things that is likely uh, a story that was told about her. Nobody claims that they saw her do this or that she said that she did this or... So it's one of those things that is likely is part of the propaganda campaign against her. Um, and in modern day Angola, I don't think that this story is given a lot of credence. Um, again, it's, it's important to remember, like, we don't talk about people at Extra History because necessarily they're likable or that they're even good people, but they are significant in some way. And the nation of Angola has adopted her as a hero and uh, has come to terms with or uh, sees some nuance in these actions. Also, someone uh, mentioned that Nzinga also had a major cultural impact on Brazilian slaves where they developed a term called Ginja, which is directly related to her, but that means uh, finding way through adversity no matter how. So there was this respect for her and what she did, and the fact that she got through a difficult time, even though it meant maybe even doing some things that, uh, that were not so great. So, you know, everyone has a complicated legacy, but the significance of someone isn't necessarily whether they were a good person or not, right? Uh, Spain and Portugal were in a personal union at that time. They had the same king, but they were different nations. Too complicated to explain in a two-episode thing. Uh, we made the Portuguese holdings in Brazil too big. Sorry about that. Coming up on Extra History, we're going to be doing a special series starting next week. Uh, the Extra History of England, The Hundred Years' War. I've seen some of these episodes. They're really neat. Uh, one of James' favorite podcasters is doing them. I think they're going to be a lot of fun. And... After that, we're doing Joan of Arc. We did not plan it this way, but we're going to be doing the English perspective on the Hundred Years' War and then the French perspective on the latter Hundred Years' War, and there's going to be a little bit of difference and a little bit of, uh, little bit of gray area between them, so that's actually turned into something really fun. It's 
almost like we meant for it to happen, though we totally did not. Uh, after that, the Inca Empire, which I'm currently in the research stages for, it's going to be a lot of fun. Just a little taste. Inca emperors used to get mummified, and then the mummies would be carried around and would visit people at their houses sometimes. And sometimes two mummies would be carried so that they could have dinner together. So, like, the mummy of one king would come visit the mummy of another king. Yeah, it's going to be really fun. Uh, after that, the topic is, we don't know. Uh, the patrons are going to vote on them pretty soon. We're currently collecting topic suggestions from the patrons. The theme is art and architecture. Uh, I thought that after the uh, burning of Notre Dame, this was a good time to think about the history of a building or maybe the history of theater or uh, a famous artist. So, yeah, we're going to be talking about world culture and uh, heritage. All right, let's do our six degrees of Walpole. Let's do our Kevin bacon -y thing of how does Robert Walpole connect to the Siege of Vienna. Six degrees. All right. So, John Sobieski, who brought his wing at Hussars, was the king of Poland-Lithuania. It's an elected position, interestingly. We should probably do that uh, at some point. It's probably a good series. But anyway, his successor as the king of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth was Augustus II the Strong. You might remember him from our Great Northern War series as the guy whose main strategy was to keep losing. So, uh, in keeping losing, he enlisted the aid of a lot of foreign powers, destabilized the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, and when he died, yada yada yada, war of Polish succession, uh, and then over in England, they're talking about, hey, there's a great war of Polish succession, should we jump in? And uh, a certain prime minister was like, no, I'll tell you what, this is between the Habsburgs and the Bourbons, and we should probably stay out of it. And later, after he successfully convinced George II, by the way, an English king who did not speak English, only German, um, that, that, that they should not join this war, he bragged, 50,000 men were slain in Europe this year, and not one Englishman. That was, of course, Robert Walpole. So, thank you very much for joining us. I hope you'll join us for the Extra History of England, the Hundred Years' War. I've seen some of these episodes. They're a lot of fun. Thanks for letting me take some time off to spend time with my new baby. I'm going to go do that. She has nicely not cried through this entire thing. All right, thanks. See you later.